Well, we can tell that the, uh, the main thrust of what's been discussed here, I think if I could summarize a little bit, Dr. Lycona, that you came up with facts and methods. So there's four facts that you're relying upon to uh, accommodate the most plausible, uh, um, the exploratory or the explanatory power, less ad hoc, and you had the criteria for the um, plausibility and whatnot. And then Dr. Friesen, you said that there are central claims to Christianity that fall outside of history, and that some more minor uh, events in the New Testament may fall within the historical method, but you allege that they could actually be proven false and true, so it doesn't, it doesn't help the case. So with that, I'd like to uh, invite questions from the audience. This is the real fun part, not to take anything away that, so far, but we'd like to hear from you. And if you could make your ways down to the microphones, we'll start there and intersperse them with some questions here. Okay, maybe uh, start with a live question, I'll go to the one on the screen in a minute. Is there anybody ready? Waiting for the brave souls to come up to the mics. Don't be shy unless everybody texted their questions. So maybe we'll go back to the text question and then come back to the audience. Okay, the question directed for Dr. Lycona is hallucination really one of the two leading hypotheses for the resurrection? It seems like an agreed upon lie by all the writers of the gospels is more in line with what many atheists would espouse. Are there other hypotheses for the resurrection, and what are their significant shortcomings? Okay, so, yeah, believe it or not, it is the leading alternative hypothesis. Um, and when I say this, I'm saying this is what scholars offer. Uh, I, honestly, I don't know of any scholar out there who would say that the gospel authors were in this conspiracy to lie about the whole thing. I don't know of a single scholar who would say that. Uh, now, maybe someone outside the field of history or, or New Testament studies would say it, but I, I don't know of any scholar who would say it. And publishing on the World Wide Web does not make you a world-class scholar. So um, uh, the last part of that, are there any other hypotheses for the resurrection? And, well, yeah, there's um, like George Nicholsburg uh, uh, of Harvard. I, I don't know if he's still at Harvard, but he would say that resurrection was a metaphor um, uh, that just signified that uh, God had uh, vindicated Jesus in heaven, just like he vindicates every Jewish martyr, and Jesus is the most recent one. Well, I, I think that's the most easily refuted one out there. Um, you know, first of all, you've got to show some evidence for it, not just say it, but Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 20 says Christ is the first fruits of those who sleep. In other words, he's the first to be raised from the dead with the resurrection body, and then three verses later he says, well, you know, uh, each in his own order, Christ the first fruits. after that, those who belong to Christ, followers of Jesus, at his coming. So Jesus first for resurrection, and then all his followers when he returns. There's, you know, so Jesus isn't the most recent Jewish martyr to stand okay. in a long line who is verified. And there are others, but, I mean, they're, they're just, they're weak. Dr. Friesen, do you have anything to add? Well, the, I mean, the... the uh, Gospel of Matthew gives us one that, that, that the body was stolen. Yeah. So we would have advocates for that of that view also. I, yeah, maybe in the past, but as far as I know, today there is I don't I couldn't name a single scholar who says that fraud was involved, that the disciples were lying or stole the body. I don't I don't know a single scholar who would say that. Um, Gary Habermas has actually a, done bean counting on this, and he says, uh, you know. It, this is accepted by virtually 100% of, of scholars in the relevant fields today that the disciples actually believed the risen Jesus had appeared to them. So um, you have to account for those, and they do in various ways, but at least they would they acknowledge those experiences that convinced them um, so they weren't deceptive. Well, we'll have to leave it there and go to the last question, the first person over there. Go ahead. Um, this is directed to Dr. Friesen. Um, concerning God told me to marry you, I know of two couples in which both parties got direct and personal revelations, audible, visual, and situational from God to marry each other. 
my own parents, and my good friends, uh, Winston and Christina, who are now uh, <laughs> fiancé. Um, um, my question is, if several people have consistent divine personal revela revelations, do the personal revelations become verifiable? Yes. Did, it, did everybody hear that? Okay, so the question was back to the God told me to marry her or him question. So if that happened, can that be verifiable or considered verifiable is his question? Well, I hope they're happily married. <laughs> I would submit to those uh, individuals that if you are making your choice on that basis alone, you probably will have some second guessing. In other words, it would be surprising if that voice from God didn't confirm the intention that you may already have felt. Now that I can't speak to the individual situation. But I think it, in the manner that I am deploying the term verification, I, don't, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't take that to be verification in a sort of strictly scientifically, uh, uh, scientific context. If God tells me to marry somebody, then I go and approach that person and she says, oh yeah, God told that to me also. Well, um, then you can set the date for the wedding at least. Um, <laughs> but I, it, it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't satisfy me. I'm a, I mean, I'm just a skeptic to, for those sorts of things. Now, um, the voice of God speaks to people in, in all kinds of different ways. And I wouldn't suggest, I wouldn't want to suggest to such happily married couples that they, what they experienced wasn't true and genuine and meaningful simply that it isn't the kind of thing I would admit into a, into, uh, well, a court of law, for instance. Um, God told me to divorce you wouldn't pass the test for uh, uh, the of law either. So, yeah, I mean, those are interesting. I mean, clearly those sorts of experiences are, are held. Just like the first century Christians really genuinely had experiences. Um, I don't disagree with Dr. Lacona on that point that there was something that, there was some kind of transformative experience. Paul particularly had one. Um, whether, you know, so uh, I'm just suggesting that the nature of that kind of experience of private revelation um, is, is difficult to rise to the level of verification. Okay. Can I hope you that helps a little bit. One minute response? Yeah, sure. I, I agree with him actually. Um, without hearing the details of the two things that you gave, now, I had an, an old friend back when we lived in Virginia Beach, Mike Kowalski, and he and his wife, Rebecca, had an experience like that. They hated each other. They worked with each other. They hated each other. I mean, it was just they rubbed each other the wrong way. And Mike told me that one morning he, he woke up and he was spending some time in, you know, reading scriptures and praying. And he said, as though God spoke to him uh, and said, I want you to marry Rebecca. And he said, oh, you got to be kidding. I don't, I don't want to do that. But he just really felt it. He goes into work that day and he passes by Rebecca and she's crying. And he says, you okay? Yeah, I'm, I'm okay. And then he ends up asking her out at one point. And she goes and, and she says, I got to confess to you why I was crying. Because God had just told me sitting there that he wanted me to marry you. <laughs> And so I look at that and I say, gee, I, well, I, 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 there's no scientific way of verifying that, but the coincidence seems to me to be good enough to say, I mean, I would ask her to marry me at that point if I had that. <laughs> we often decide for ourselves on that one. <laughs> Let's go over there, Jason number two. So I have, a, I have two questions. The first is rather minor, um, and it addresses whether or not these claims are verifiable. Uh, you've done a great job of uh, presenting textual claims and textual evidence, but I'm wondering what your physical or material evidence is for these claims. Um, that comes from me personally as an archaeologist. I'm very 
rooted in a material culture background. Um, but more importantly, I'm interested in the second half of what this talk was about, which is, does it matter? You're addressing a group of academics who are very aware of the uh, process that goes into constructing a religion. And at least since the Reformation, the major issue in the Christian faith has been faith, not necessarily knowledge and scientific uh, evidence. So what does it mean for a modern society to care whether or not these claims are verifiable and what is the role of faith? Well, I, and you're asking me, I guess, right? So. Oh, no, I'm asking both of you, actually, because oh. I'm a classicist and a classical archaeologist, so I'm sure Dr. Friesen can uh, address those as well. You want to go first? Well, I mean, for archaeological evidence, there is none. Um, but on the other hand, I mean, just what kind of evidence would we really expect to have? I mean, um, so, you know, we don't know where the tomb is, and so we can't verify an empty tomb. So, you know, those are, so, those are really things that are beyond... Um, you know, they're, they're, I, we don't, I don't expect that that's going to change any time in the near future. Um, but in, in terms of, of how it matters, and I, I tried, did try briefly to speak to this at the end, because I think for many Christians, um, um, evidence matters a lot. Um, but I, um, I did try just briefly to articulate my own worry about an undue um, recourse to evidence. And in fact, it might just be that a ver a, you know, a, a self-perception or a self an understanding of Christianity that does not hang and fall on, on one's ability to um, demonstrate the, uh, the the scientific uh, nature of of the the beliefs that one holds is actually potentially um, uh, a, a liberating uh, moment for people. Potentially, right? That that what I what I tried to argue or what I tried to suggest is that conversely, the the the, the real core of what is in the Nicene Creed and what sort of stands at the heart of historic Christianity is just not in, it's just not part of this kind of field of inquiry. And um, I suspect that some Christians would find that um, to, to resonate with experience, right? That what convinces people of, of the resurrection um, is not something that we can point to scientifically. Well, I would answer about the archaeological evidence for the resurrection. That we don't have archaeological evidence for a lot of things. So, for example, when Alexander the Great finished his conquest and went into India, he set up 12 altars, each of which were 75 feet tall. We don't have a scrap of evidence for those. When uh, the Roman general Crassus defeated Spartacus in uh, 71 BC, Plutarch says he built a wall that was 40 miles long in order to hem in Spartacus and his army. I mean, it may have been an exaggeration by Plutarch, but it was still a very long wall, not a scrap of that remains. Um, in 48 BC, you had Caesar defeated Pompey at Pharsalus, where tens of thousands died, and archaeologists have never found anything. We don't even know where Pharsalus was in terms of the battlefield, yet tens of thousands died. Um, so. We don't look for archaeological evidence to verify certain things. Most things in history are verified by documentary evidence. Now, in terms of uh, does it matter, you ask about faith since the Reformation. Yeah, as a Protestant, I do believe that salvation is by faith, but that doesn't mean that I can't have a reasonable faith. And if you look at Paul and the book of Acts and the sermons in it, they would present the truth of Christianity based on the miracles and resurrection of Jesus so even the apostles were preaching, hey, uh, you can believe because this is true, and here's some evidence for it. Now, uh, Courtney did mention uh, Doubting Thomas uh, in his rebuttal, and you know, there Jesus says, hey, uh, 
Thomas, you've seen and believed, but blessed are those who have not seen and still believe. Well, the term blessed there in Greek, the word is makarios. It's the same Greek word used in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful, etc. And it, we, the Greek word does not mean that God is going to bless you or you receive a blessing because you do these things. Uh, makarios means joyful, free of care or concern. Uh, many scholars today are, are using the term flourishing. So in essence, what Jesus is saying to Thomas, Thomas, you've seen and yet and, and you believe because you've seen, but people can flourish in their walk with Christ. They can flourish in their Christian life um, without seeing. Uh, they can still believe and flourish in their faith. Good. We're going to do one more round of the live questions and then go back to the screen. So go ahead. Hi. Uh, first, I'd like to say, hi, Mike Lacona. Um, it's nice to meet you in person after all this time. Oh. Eric Lounsbury. Oh, wow. Hey, okay. Pal. Hey, good to meet you. <laughs> Doc, uh, Dr. Friesen, a couple questions, if you wouldn't mind. Um, let's, just you tell one, me, let's just do one question, if that's okay. Okay. Um, do you believe, can, can you tell me, uh, do you believe that Jesus sinned? And can you name one, if so? <laughs> Uh, I, I don't, I'm, I, you know, I'm not qualified to answer. I mean, I, uh, does your second question illuminate that a little it, bit? It, it, Why don't you ask <laughs> <laughs> I may have to allow it. If Why don't you ask okay. a follow up that yeah, I have? Sure. Well, when the Old Testament was written, God spoke to the prophets and he gave them, that he gave them word as to certain conditions that the Messiah would fulfill so that we could recognize him. And imagine if one of those conditions was that the Messiah, when he came, we, we know that the scripture says he would be born in Bethlehem, that he would have to come before the destruction of the second temple. But what if one of the conditions was that he had to be able to run a thousand miles an hour? Now that wasn't one of the conditions, but if that was a condition, that would certainly set him apart from every other person and allow us to recognize him if we had somebody that was born in Bethlehem that came before the destruction of the second temple and was able to run a thousand miles an hour, would you not agree? If he could do that. Okay, are you aware of the fact that one of the conditions that absolutely positively had to be fulfilled in the Messiah is that he had to be holy. He had to be without sin. Isaiah 53 says he would die for the sins of the people. Now, stop and think about this. Okay, hold of on, all of hold the on, people, just one second. Yes. We, we want to try to avoid the lengthy questions. Okay. And I, I think what you're getting at, and correct me if I'm wrong, is the, the power of prophecy or the non-power of prophecy in predicting Jesus as a historical figure. Are you asking the, the, the relevance of prophecy in the historical verification? No, actually, uh, um, th that's not it. The point is... Can, can, is you, make, can you try to do it in one sentence? One, let's try to... One, one condition sentence. was that he would be without sin. The only person that the vast majority of the world accepts that has ever lived without sin, including those who do not follow Christ, as apparently yourself, but the entire Muslim world, no person who's ever lived has been accepted by his enemies as to be a man without sin. Okay, so the one okay person I, I'm going to just cut you off there. I told you yes. I'd be the bad guy, so I have sure. to do that. So I'll let you uh, respond, uh, Courtney, and then Mike afterwards. And we'll go from there. Okay. Thank you for your comment. Uh, Mike, I, do you have anything to Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know that we could verify that Jesus was without sin. I mean... Scripture says it. I, I don't know that that's capable of verification, though. Thank you for your question. We're going to go over there and then up to the screen. Uh, quick question. Uh, what would it take for you to take the other person to you? For, uh, Dr. Lycona, I know you mentioned it in your book, uh, but would both of you just comment on what would it take for you to accept the resurrection or for you to reject the resurrection? I can go first. Yeah, so I think, <clears throat> thank you, that's a, that is, that's a really useful and interesting way to frame the question. I should just, I mean, just as a point of clarification, in, in the comments that I have made this evening, I have been careful to steer away from rejecting the resurrection, um, merely that the resurrection is not the sort of thing that lends itself to verification. 
So that is to say that the um, that the the evidence that we have available to us doesn't um, amount to the to, for me to the, to the to the level of confidence for of say the execution of Jesus under Pontius Pilate. So on that point, I mean, uh, I don't think Dr. Lycona and I are are in fact necessarily sitting on two opposite poles here. In the, um, um, we agree on the same bedrock historical uh, material. Mm -hmm. And um, we agree that um, it would be nice to be able to explain how you get from a dead Jesus in the grave to um, the conviction held by many people within a few years of his death, that he was risen from the dead. Um, it's simply a matter of, as the debate was framed tonight, around whether or not the linkage between those two points is verifiable. And that's really the heart of the, the disagreement, in, in that I just don't think that um, the evidence that's available to us allows us to claim that kind of verification in a strictly academic historical sense. So in order to take Dr. Lacona's position, I guess what, what, what it would require, so to, get, to try to finally answer your question, if I, if I may, um, although I don't, know, I don't know that I'm quite able to, but um, in order to suggest, in order to take the view that the resurrection is verified, I would want to have an unbiased, independent source. So, in other words, as, as you've seen over the course of our discussion, I, I, I think that the testimony of Christians, even if it includes er, uh, several early, presumably independent ones like Paul, Mark, um, and the Gospel writers, um, those, those sources just aren't, aren't detached enough from what they're describing in order to count as verification. I, if, uh, well, yeah, but... Paul, he was, yeah, he was biased at the time of writing because he was a Christian, but he was biased in the opposite direction when he had the appearance. He's actually hostile toward sure. Christianity. So if we actually had a, a document from a non-Christian that said, hey, Jesus rose, I saw him, I'm not a Christian, we would think such a person was a moron and not a good source. <laughs> um, so I think with Paul, we kind of have the best, very best we could ask for. Um, in terms of what it would take me to say that Jesus didn't rise from the dead. I would want to see it, what it, when you subject it to strictly controlled historical method using arguments of inference to the best explanation, I'd want to see a hypothesis that was, uh, was significantly superior to the resurrection hypothesis. Or for the woman who asked the question and she likes archi, uh, artifacts, um, I would want to have archaeologists discover an ossuary, a bone box in Jerusalem, and it says Jesus, uh, son of Joseph on it. When you open it up, there's the bones of a crucified victim and with a manuscript on it that says in Greek, we fooled the world until today, and it's signed by Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and <laughs> um, And I'd want to be able to verify that those were the bones of Jesus, so if you could do that, then I would give up the Christian faith for sure. Yeah. Fair enough. We'll get right to you, and we're going to go to the screen for this one. In what, okay, this one is for both of you, so both pay attention here. In what balance should the verifiable and the unverifiable aspects of Christianity be held? In other words, you both stated it matters if we can verify the Christian claims, but how much verification is necessary and or reasonable in the personal faith of an individual to accept Christianity as truth? Dr. Friesen? Well, uh, toward the latter part of this question, I can't, I mean, I can't answer on the basis of any individual. Um, so that's very much up to the questioner. Um, what I try to do is to frame the uh, discussion around a couple of historical points of reference, you know, notably the Nicene Creed, and to try to 
make the point that that those that those central Christian notions are really not um, verifiable. Now, whether they are reasonable is a, is, a, is a different question entirely, right? Do they do they make sense? And that's something that could be pursued and is worth pursuing further. We won't get to that tonight, but does the the, do the, the theological notions that are presented in the Nicene Creed um, stand up to your, your or my own experience of the world as we see it? And those are, those are questions that are worth thinking about, but again, they're not, they're not part of this process of verification. They're not the sorts of things that we amass evidence for. Um, they're, for many people, they're deeply personal, um, for others, they're sort of philosophical and ethical, um, and so that very, I think that very much comes down to the individual who, uh, who's asking the question. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree with you entirely. Um, there's just, it's impossible to verify theological claims. Uh, I mean, you don't put your laptop in an MRI in order to diagnose why it's running slowly. It, because the MRI is the wrong tool for that, and you just can't use historical tools to verify a theological claim. There's just no way to do that. Um, for me, whether Christianity is true makes a big difference, because if you are going to be a true and authentic follower of Jesus, it requires sacrifice at times. And in many places in the world, it means that persecution and even martyrdom. So I don't want to just embrace a worldview, uh, Christianity or whatever, because that's the way I was raised. I want to embrace it because it's true, especially if it's going to be costly to me. So for me, that's why the, something like the resurrection of Jesus is important. I may not be, I can't verify that Jesus' death atones for my sin. I can't verify that Jesus is seated right now at God's right hand or that he's God's divine, uniquely divine son. But if Jesus rose from the dead, I think I'm rational to believe in the virgin birth because if Jesus rose, virgin birth is child's play. <laughs> and, <laughs> and if he rose, then his claims about himself are probably true and the message that he taught about salvation is probably true if he rose from the dead. So I don't have to prove those kinds of things, but if Jesus resurrection probably occurred, I'm certainly rational in believing those theological claims that I can't prove. Good. Let's go to what might be our last question. Okay. I, Dr. Friesen, yeah. I'm finding myself a little bit uh, questioning about your, your standard of evidence, what you consider as evidence. For example, I've been told that there is absolutely no archaeological evidence that could be, be connected to the, to the Peloponnesian Wars. We have only one source for knowledge of that, namely Thucydides. And, uh, if, in, and here with the, with the Gospels, we have at least four or five different sources. And uh, oh yeah, I also, also want to make one slight correction. Uh, in 1 Samuel, Ahimelech is just one of over 80 priests, and Abiathar was another of those priests. Let's, so, let's pick your question. And but but my question there. goes back to, to <laughs> and, then, and then also I find myself questioning the, the you're saying it's, it's so personal, but when we like look at, for example, like I, I think of Daniel 9, the, uh, the, the, there's a prophecy in there which just, where the book is known before uh, Jesus was alive, but it prophesizes concerning the Roman destruction of Jerusalem. So how's, how's that exactly non... Was that Daniel 9? You 9, 26b through 27, yes. Referencing the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem? Well, referencing Ju the, the, the Jewish revolt, 66 AD okay. through, and it includes the destruction of the temple. Okay, okay so you, you managed to slide three in there, so I'll go back and take them in reverse order. I mean, clearly the, the, the content of the Danielic prophecy is going to be disputed, whether it was a reference to Rome. Um, uh, so you're, you're right, Abiathar, Abiathar was, the, was, the, was the son of Himalek and doesn't appear until later. Now, that, that, of course, doesn't solve the problem I mean, that, that, uh, that I raised, but you're right. He, 
he seems to be identified as the high priest in Mark, which we don't, which which is not found in First Samuel. I grant that, yeah. And then, um, yeah, the first question. I mean, the, the, you're right. The Peloponnesian War. Uh, you, you, while you're not technically correct, I wouldn't say that that Thucydides is the only source. That's what I was told. Yeah. So, well, I mean, we have a lot of other ancient references uh, and contemporary references to the Peloponnesian War from literature of the time period, um, ranging from um, you know material that we find in dramatic productions in Athens, <coughs> Aristophanes, comedies. Uh, we will have Xenophon and others who will have references to it. But you, you're absolutely right that when we're reconstructing anything from the ancient world, much of it is uh, very difficult to verify. Okay. And there are, are we, 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 you're going to cut me off there. Almost. But on that point, we're in agreement that historical reconstruction of, of ancient events is um, very, very, very difficult with what the material we have. Good. And you're taking a pass on that one. OK. All right, let's uh, go over here for a live question. Um, uh, my question relates to the power of personal testimony. And uh, I'll try to make this quick. In, in the ancient church, there was, a, there was an awful lot of uh, mar martyrdom among Christians. And the ways that they were killed was often like brutal. Um, and, uh, and, and then there's even Christians today, like Dr. Lacuna was saying, that they're, they're martyred for their faith. My question is basically um, claims of the, 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 uh, the, the, the ancient martyrdom and modern claims of uh, like uh, healings, you know, miraculous healings and stuff. Those, that, it seems like that's something that could be verified. So is there, is, is, are the ancient stories of martyrdom, are, is that a type of evidence? And on modern accounts of miracles, does that, can that stand as evidence? All ancient martyrdom of Christians shows is that they believed that what they believed is true. That's all it shows. Um, they probably wouldn't go through all that suffering for something they knew was false. The, all, all the early Christians, okay? Now, and same thing with Christians being martyred today. It's no different than jihadists who are given their lives for their cause or anyone who's given their life. It just shows that they are dying for what they believe is true, but it doesn't mean what they believe is true. Now, I will say, though, for the disciples, it's a little bit different because they would have known what they were suffering for was true or false. And liars make poor martyrs. And this is why the majority of scholars today, given the evidence we have that they were proclaiming that Jesus had been raised and they were willing to suffer continuously and willing to die for that proclamation, has led scholars to conclude that they were not only saying Jesus had appeared to them, they actually believed it. Okay. Can I answer that? Um, oh. uh, would you be willing to address one of those questions? Yeah, so I, I think I don't disagree um, with, with the point in general to, to say that um, I think that it is certainly the case that um, the, the, the people who became convinced of this, uh, of, of the resurrection, were, uh, had a, a strong enough conviction that many of them um, were willing to die for it. Now, we should add that the evidence for when these people start getting martyred, of course, comes quite a bit later. For some of them. For some of them. What we know about Peter and Paul is, is even quite murky. And, uh, you know, we have the reports and acts and so forth. And we've got John who talks about the, uh, the death of Paul, right? Yeah, so... Uh, uh, Peter, I mean. Uh, uh, yes, okay. Yeah, right, fair enough. So we, we know these, we know the, these people are going to are going to die. But I think I, I agree with Dr. Lacona that, that um, being a willing martyr is not sufficient for me to rise to the level of verification for what the martyr believed that motivated him or her to act in that way. And it, it, because if it was, then we would need to treat similarly all faith traditions which, uh, have, have, which have inspired martyrs, right? So we're told 
Uh, you know, I mean, that we, we've already, uh, Dr. Lacona mentioned, um, you know, jihadists, and I think that's a very good example, right? They have, uh, we're, we're told, act on, according to a certain promise of a reward in the afterlife, a certain number of virgins that they'll receive in paradise. I, for one, am not comfortable to suggest that their conviction to die for that belief establishes or verifies the reality of that belief. I understand that that's much, it's much further removed from the actual, uh, from the origin of Islam than, right. the, yeah. than the martyrdom of the early disciples. Right, and, that, and so that Dr. Lakono's point is, is, is well taken, that these are, you know, that these are first, there are people in the first generation of Jesus' followers who, um, we, who seem to have given their, or who seem to have died as martyrs. Yeah, I mean, that's, that, that's not deniable. All right, one more question here, and then we'll try to get the one on the slide, and then we're going to have to start wrapping it up because we do have a hard stop to give the room back to the university. So, Jason? Um, yeah, I've heard also a, a theory about the resurrection that Jesus wasn't actually dead, that they thought he was, but he wasn't. So I was curious if that actually is a prominent theory and what evidence there is that Jesus was actually dead. All right, fair question. Um, I'm only aware of maybe a handful of scholars who have posited that since 1985. Um, one is Barbara Tiering, um, and, and she basically says Jesus survived his death. Uh, he was put in the tomb, and they used aloe and herbs to heal him, and he came back to perfect health, and then he married Mary Magdalene, and they went off to France and you know, had children. But nobody accepts that today except Barbara Thierry, and that's stuff with the Da Vinci Code, not scholarship. Um, there have been about others, maybe a handful, but they're typically not scholars in the relevant field. They're philosophers who would say, well, maybe Jesus um, survived his death. And they're of the uber-skeptical ilk, and again, there's not even a handful of those since 1985. The reason the overwhelming majority of the near consensus of scholars would say today that Jesus died, there's numerous reasons. Number one, it's multiply attested in independent sort, multiply independent sources, early sources, um, unsympathetic sources like Josephus, Tacitus, Lucian, Marabar, Serapian. Um, you've, you've got the fact that uh, the chances of surviving crucifixion are extremely small. We only have one testimony from antiquity of someone uh, experience or being surviving crucifixion, and that's Josephus who mentions during the fall of Jerusalem he saw three of his friends crucified, and he went to his friend, the Roman commander Titus, and as a favor he asked Titus to spare their lives. Titus ordered that all three be removed from their crosses and provided the best medical care Rome had to offer. In spite of that, two of the three still died. So even if Jesus was removed prematurely and medically assisted, his chances of survival were next to nil. They were very small. Moreover, there's no evidence that Jesus was removed while alive or provided medi any medical care whatsoever, much less Rome's best. Historians have to go with probabilities, not remote possibilities. So given all the evidence we have for Jesus' death for crucifi by crucifixion, without good evidence to the contrary, the historian at least must conclude that Jesus was crucified and that the process killed him. Dr. Fries in the swoon theory, what do you think of it? I'll, I, I will. Um, okay. Hurry us along? What, with one sentence. The Romans knew how to kill people, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this one is uh, back to you, Dr. Friesen. You talk about how people came to believe Jesus. How would you describe the presence of Christianity not dying out, but instead you see it expand and spread as we see it now? If the resurrection was not a fact, why is it such a debated topic now? Yeah, so the, 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 the gospel message of Christianity, which entailed the resurrection of Jesus, was profoundly transformative. And it, uh, I, I uh, suspect, um, radically transformed the way people thought about the world and the way that they imagined that God was going to bring justice amidst the Roman imperial regime, which they weren't fond of in Judea, in Galilee. And 
that Jesus, the, the notion that Jesus had raised from the dead convinced many of these people that the end of the age was now emerging and that God's kingdom was at hand and it provided them a hope that um, that they themselves would be raised at the end of the age when Christ returned. And that message, of course, still touches people today and uh, attracts uh, faith and conviction all around the world. And so it doesn't come as a surprise that it attracted attention um, and conviction in the first century. Um, I'm not sure if I fully answered the question. Um, I, don't, I think I'll skip the last part. If it, I, I, I don't know that um, I think people debate all kinds of non-facts, um, whether they're uh, in the news or otherwise. And so that, I guess that um, is not something that I, um, I don't know if I can how to respond to that, but I'll sure. that would just work with me. Yeah, well, I, I, I wouldn't use that as an argument for the truth of Christianity or the resurrection. I mean, I think we could say the same thing about Islam. And you could say, well, if Muhammad didn't actually have those revelations of the Quran, then how do you explain Islam's explosive growth to where it is today? So, yeah. Well, great. We're, uh, we're up against the time crunch, but before we leave, could either of you please maybe tie up any loose ends or any last closing comments? And I'll pitch it to you, Dr. Friesen, if you want it for about three minutes. Stay here. I think you okay. can stay there. Well, thank you again for, for, uh, for, for all of you who've made the journey out on this late evening. And uh, um, just to reiterate that um, I am here on campus just down the road there, um, and my email address is readily accessible, so the conversation doesn't have to stop now. It will continue in, in the fall semester, we'll be offering a course on the New Testament where you can come and, and, and look at these things for yourself. You can, um, um, so I'd be very happy to, to um, talk with any of you about that. We have. In fact, some students here that I can see who have taken related courses. Um, so uh, don't hesitate to furnish yourself with the opportunities that Arizona provides you to, to study um, all kinds of matters related to Christianity, including really these central topics that we uh, have talked about today. So in my class, we'll spend quite a bit of time um, looking at what kind of evidence we have for the historical Jesus and his first followers. So I'll just have a few just prepared remarks and then I'll pass it, pass it back. Um, so the Gospel of Matthew reports that when Jesus appeared to his disciples in Galilee after the resurrection, among those who saw him physically and even literally, quote, some worshipped, but some doubted, end quote. So for this crowd, even presented with the most conclusive of evidence, verification did not achieve a successful outcome. And from where we stand, of course, nothing approaching that level of demonstration will be available. Indeed, what I have proposed is that for those Christian claims that have been most cherished throughout history, uh, verification is rarely ever successful, or accessible, rather. So consider Paul's programmatic statement about the gospel in Romans chapter 1. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed through faith and for faith. Now Christians have consistently maintained that Jesus' self-giving death uh, broke down the barriers that divide humans. And through the resurrection, God demonstrated that love, justice, peace, forgiveness, and reconciliation have the final say. In these, we must hope, reside life-giving and transformative power. Perhaps then these claims, or rather these convictions, are not 
merely one among many, but rather are so fundamental as to be the basis against which all other claims must be assessed. So Christians might do well to attend to the comments of the 20th century Protestant theologian Karl Barth, commenting on Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Quote, The gospel is not a truth among truths. Rather, it is, assessed, it is a question mark set against all truths. The person who apprehends its meaning is removed from all strife within the whole, even with existence itself. Anxiety concerning the victory of the gospel, that is, Christian apologetics, is meaningless because the gospel is the victory by which the world is overcome. Thank you. Yeah, well, I, I just want to thank you for having me and Courtney. I've just I've, I've enjoyed my time with you last night. I've enjoyed this tonight, so so thanks. Um, so, in response to one thing he just said there in Matthew twenty-eight, where at the resurrection uh, afterward, when they went to Galilee, and it said some believed but others doubted. Uh, the word that's used there is distadzo, which means to have two thoughts. It's the same word used in Matthew when Jesus is walking on water and he invites Peter to come. He's walking on water and then he begins to sink and ask Jesus to save him. And so Jesus pulls him up and says, why did you doubt this Hadzo? He's having two separate thoughts. It's like, hey, this is really cool. I believe in you. But then he gets out there and he says, but how am I doing this? And he, 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 he starts to sink. He's having two thoughts. So you think about this, they could be like if my, both of my parents have died within the last five years, but what if they came in the auditorium right now and they walked up on stage and said, hey Mike, we're just proud of you, what you're doing here, nice job tonight. I mean, it's like, wait a minute, you're dead. But it's like, I see that, it's this Tadzo, it's thinking two separate thoughts. Luke uses a different term, he uses apostas, unbelieving, when he, they, he says, out of joy and amazement, they were unbelieving when they saw Jesus. It's like the walk-off home run in the bottom of the ninth and seventh game of the World Series. Unbelievable. That's what's going on here, I think, in Matthew 28. Now, what I just want to reiterate, why the resurrection is important to me is because ever, well, all of us have our idiosyncrasies, and one of mine is I'm a second guesser. I doubt a lot. And it's because it's so important, our worldviews, if eternity if it's possible that eternity hangs in the balance, what we do uh, with God and what we believe, um, and Jesus claimed, I, I think, to be the only way, if that's true, then, well, I want to know it's true. And it's not just a matter for me of believing because the Bible said it. If I'm going to have to make sacrifices in my life, if I have to be willing to be persecuted and even martyred, I want to know, I want to have some confidence that what I believe is true. And, and so that's why the resurrection and evidence is important to me. Does it matter? Yes. Because if Jesus rose from the dead, then that means I probably was made in God's image, that I have value, that there is real meaning to life. And for each and every one of us on a practical basis, if we really are that valuable because we've been made in God's image and he loves us, as Jesus said, then we can trust him, we can pray. For college students here, you can ask God to lead you to a good spouse. I did, and I've been married for over 30 years. I married a really great woman. But man, I fasted a lot, and I prayed a lot, and asked God to help me select a spouse. Um, it, and I'll tell you, it made a world of difference to my parents when they were dying, to have that confidence. Now, they weren't doing it as a psychological crutch. They really believed that Christianity was true. And if Jesus rose from the dead, that belief was well-founded. Thank you, Dr. Martin. So I hope these two men have uh, proven the fact that the New Testament is studied by serious scholars. And throughout the world and throughout the country, there are serious scholars from a fundamental, a fundamental Christian to a yeah, fundamental atheist. So you have then everything in between. So you don't go to the University of Pretoria. No, no, I'm not, 
I was using just hand gestures randomly there. <laughs> or subconsciously, I hope not though. Okay, so you don't go debating the top Muslim apologist, Shabir Ali, or the uh, rock star celebrity New Testament scholar, Bart Ehrman. You don't uh, go to uh, get your PhD at the University of Minnesota and then on to Oxford and then come and be the one and only premier New Testament scholar here at University of Arizona. Um, unless you're a serious scholar. So there's serious men studying these things, and so I hope that that's a takeaway for you today. <laughs>